The Japanese government insists the nuclear crisis in the northeast of the country is being contained, but at the same time says there's what it calls partial meltdown at two of the six nuclear reactors in the Fukushima Daiichi plant. What does this mean? As some 200,000 people are evacuated from the area, is Japan facing a nuclear disaster or not? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Mike Hanna. The authorities are still battling to contain the nuclear events in Fukushima Prefecture that came in the wake of the country's largest ever recorded earthquake. There are conflicting accounts of the radiation levels being measured in the vicinity of the Fukushima Daiichi plant, where seawater is being injected into at least two of the reactors in an attempt to prevent the nuclear fuel from melting as the temperatures continue to rise. There was an explosion at the plant's number one reactor Saturday, but the government says the massive concrete containment structure surrounding the nuclear core remains intact. But the government's also confirmed that temperature is continuing to rise in at least one of the other reactors due to a failure of the backup cooling systems. Harry Fawcett has more. The sickening sight of a nuclear reactor building vanishing in an instant. The blast at the Daiichi nuclear power plant in Fukushima was above reactor one, seen here circled in yellow. Its outer structure is gone. The government says it was the result of gases mixing outside the core, which retains its own casing, and that radiation levels have decreased since. An emergency coolant mixture of seawater and boric acid is being injected into the core. Of the five other reactors at the plant, the operator TEPCO says two are experiencing coolant problems. We can stabilize the reactor if we take the air out and pump water in the vessel properly. This will be a controlled release and the air will contain radioactive substances. However, it will not affect the health of humans and will do this in order to stabilize the reactor in a controlled manner. Over 100,000 people have been evacuated from the area. Residents are being told they need to stay a safe distance away from the reactor. We are told 10 kilometers or 20 kilometers away is safe, but the radiation may change and go out wider. It's very disturbing. There's no way to get out of here. And still the aftershocks strike the area. Drivers now accustomed to them, glad simply to have found that rarest of things, an open petrol station. All these drivers are being told they can have a maximum of 20 litres of fuel. That's because the local Fukushima prefectural government wants to preserve stocks in petrol stations like this for the emergency services. Nonetheless, people are taking whatever they can get. No one wants to be stuck somewhere they shouldn't be with an empty tank with the situation at the nuclear power stations just some 50 kilometres away. People are being tested for radiation. There are already confirmed cases of exposure. Japanese authorities say they will hand out iodine in the area to counteract the effects. Harry Fawcett, Al Jazeera, Fukushima Prefecture, Japan. Well, for more on all of this, I'm joined by our three guests. From Islamabad, Kamal Matanuddin, a nuclear and security expert. He also authored a book called The Nuclearization of South Asia. From Vienna, Robert Kelly, a licensed nuclear engineer. He also worked at the U.S. Department of Energy under the Radiological Emergency Response Unit. And joining us here in Doha, Ilam Al-Karadawi, Professor of Physics at Qatar University. A warm welcome to all our guests. Let's begin with Robert Kelly in Vienna. There have been conflicting theories as to exactly what is happening. There's also been conflicting information being released from various sources about the course of events. In terms of your understanding, what has brought us to the point where some 200,000 people are being evacuated from that area? I think you have to look back to this plant having been designed in the 1960s and that the uh, people who designed it, the engineers, were working with a fairly new technology. They had two goals. One was to build something very expensive, very important, that would not break and, and would continue to make money and make electricity. They've clearly failed at that. After 40 years, this, this machine is broken. It's ruined, it'll never be used again. But the higher priority was to make sure there'd never be some kind of major threat to the public. And I think they're hanging on right now to the possibility they'll achieve that goal. It's very, very dangerous situation. 
It's not under control yet, but I think that they have a chance of succeeding. Uh, what we know about the first unit actually I think is more positive and optimistic than what we've heard about this third unit. Uh, the information coming out about it today has been a little, little sketchier. Well, uh, Ilham al Karadawi in Doha, how serious is this situation? It's very difficult to gauge some 24 hours after the sequence of events began. How much of a threat is it to the people in the immediate region and further beyond? I think the Japanese authorities have taken all the precautionary measures and more to make it safe for the people. It might not be safe for the reactors and maybe one or two of those reactors might not be able to work afterwards. But uh, I think they are taking all precautionary measures to evacuate the area, to monitor people and to give potassium iodide which is a main uh, counterpart uh, to the uh, iodine, uh, which would um, be released at this stage. Well, Kamal Matanuddin in Islamabad, uh, let's follow up on that. We hear there that uh, precautions are being taken. The iodine is being given to people in the vicinity of the plants. Now, that in itself does appear to indicate that there has been some radiation, uh, radiation uh, released into the region, does it not? I think the information that we are receiving uh, from Japan uh, does indicate uh, that they are taking all possible measures to reduce the effect of the radiation leaks. Uh, but that does not mean that uh, the possibility of any major disaster occurring there because of the overheating of these reactors is very much there the possibility of a meltdown because these uh, nuclear uh, devices and nuclear appliances that are there, they all have to be kept under certain pressure and certain temperatures. The moment the temperatures rise beyond the specifications, then the possibility of a meltdown is there. And if, God forbid, uh, some reactor uh, melts down, then the possibility and the uh, chances of radioactivity will increase manifold. So I think uh, what efforts, whatever efforts that are being made at the moment have to be substantiated and increased to ensure that the coolants are available, that these reactors uh, do not overheat and melt down because that will be a real disaster if that occurs. At the moment, it is a matter of great concern, no doubt. It is very disturbing uh, because the radioactivity has leaked out uh, because of the explosion that has occurred but it is still manageable and the radioactivity, according to the Japanese, is well below the uh, dangerous level. So I think so far uh, it is under kind of a control, but one cannot say what is going to happen in the future because of the temperatures not being able, to, you have to control both the pressure and the temperature has to be kept under certain specified limits. And if those limits are crossed, then there's going to be a meltdown and that'll be a disaster. Well, Robert Kelly, let me allow you to pick up on this. We use the term meltdown, essentially a layman's phrase, which generally implies some massive disaster. But what does it exactly mean, uh, as briefly as possible? What does it mean if a reactor does melt down? The term is being thrown around very casually in this event by, by the various people commenting on it. What is clear is that this reactor has suffered immense fuel damage and that parts of the fuel inside the reactor have probably melted at the top and a lot of fission products have been released. But usually meltdown in the past has been reserved uh, for the uh, extreme situation where all the water is gone, the entire core melts, falls to the bottom of the vessel and then begins to melt through the vessel. I don't think we're anywhere close to that now. But massive fuel damage, melting of individual fuel elements, that has probably taken place. If you look at this explosion that happened uh, yesterday, when I first saw it, I, I, was, I was stunned, I was shocked. But as you look at the building afterwards, you see the explosion was actually just the sheet metal penthouse on top of the building that contains the crane. You can clearly see where that penthouse is in drawings of the, of the facility. And you can see the joint on the other three reactors where the, the sheet metal frame is above the concrete structure. The concrete structure is relatively intact. And so you've got three barriers now between the public and the fuel. Clearly there are leaks going on. 
but I don't think it's anywhere close to meltdown, nor do I think the explosion had anything to do with the core. That was just some hydrogen that was in the loft and blew the sheet metal off the crane, crane gallery. Yet of al Karadawi, uh, a very important point here, and that is to put all of this into context. Now, the, there is a international nuclear and radiological event scale which measures the uh, magnitude of nuclear events. Uh, this particular incident has been measured as a four, which means an accident with local consequences is the description. Now, compared to this Chernobyl, which was measured as a seven, uh, the extreme end of the scale at Three Mile Island, which was measured as a five. How big an event is this? I know it is early in the process, but how major is it in a country that is dealing with the impact of this massive earthquake and subsequent tsunami in addition to this nuclear crisis? I think this is not a huge uh, event as such as uh, Chernobyl because there is no nuclear cloud, which means there is no solid radioactive material that might be uh, uh, drop on the ground and get into the food chain, which is the worst uh, situation. Uh, however, there is some uh, radioactive uh, release from the reactor, and this is said to be not huge amounts and is very uh, localized in the area, and the area has been evacuated. Uh, from this point of view, it is uh, very uh, localized. Also, there has been uh, cooling of the reactor to try and minimize the radiation levels. And I just heard before the program that the radiation levels are getting down. So hopefully this will be possible to contain. Well, Kamal Matanudin, um, we do understand that the safety measures that have been put in place in these plants, even though it is, as you mentioned, 40 years old, are extreme, very different as well to make this clear from previous incidents such as um, Chernobyl. We have a structure, for example, in this case that is, uh, its integrity around it is immense, including, including that massive concrete containment vessel, which the government says uh, remains intact. Now, how important is this, that there are, even when you have a disaster like this within the core, is that the outside boundaries of the core itself remain intact? Well, as you said, there are multi-layers of uh, these devices and uh, material which contain the radioactivity inside the core. Uh, there is an immediate containment uh, within the core so that if anything happens, the radioactivity will not go out. Then beyond that, there is another level where there are concrete uh, walls, shall we say, which try to contain uh, the radioactivity. And of course, finally, there is this massive dome, which is uh, uh, sort of uh, steel, very uh, special steel, which is used to uh, construct that dome, which prevents any leakage of uh, the radioactivity. So I think all the nuclear plants, wherever they are, they, are, they take uh, special uh, measures to ensure that there are multi layers of safety devices uh, to prevent the radio radioactivity if anything goes wrong. But even then, when a thing like this happens, where there is a massive earthquake, along with that, the tsunami uh, uh, waves and so on and so forth, that even your best efforts, some activity uh, can, radioactivity can be leaked out. But uh, as has been mentioned by the other speakers, the uh, uh, Japanese government is doing its best to control the uh, little amount of radioactivity uh, that has been leaked. Well, but it's I just think greater efforts are required to cool down uh, the, the reactors. I think the US is also sending certain coolants, and they are also using seawater and so on. But what can be said, I think that these reactors, I think, will not be, uh, will not be in use anymore. Uh, after the seawater and so on uh, is pumped into it. But let's just take a look at the sequence of events that led to this, and in a way, completely unprecedented and very hard to predict. You had an initial earthquake, uh, the reactors programmed to automatically switch off uh, when they receive some form of seismic activity. What you then have is a situation where the reactor, which is running on its own power, is denied that power. There are backup systems. In this case, you had diesel generators. These diesel generators, it would appear, are taken out by a resultant tsunami. 
There is battery power as yet another emergency backup, but these batteries run out. You are left in a situation where a sequence of events have taken place that are very hard to predict and very, very hard to guard against. Would you agree with this, Robert Kelly, the fact that this is virtually unprecedented, this sequence of events that led to this point? Yeah, the, the thing that has happened here, the one thing that was really the critical event was the loss of the emergency generators to the tsunami. So someone did not anticipate the tsunami would be so significant and would come and wipe out those generators. If the generators had survived and done their job, we wouldn't be having this conversation. So it was, it was something that was not correctly predicted. If you look at the reactor right now, it, it's like a big tea kettle. If you can imagine it boiling on your stove, if you try to pour cold water down the spout of a boiling tea kettle, you'll have a very hard time doing it. But if you are successful in putting a pipe down in there and getting more cold water in than steam is coming out, you may eventually get control of the situation and there will not be a disaster. That's what they're trying to do right now. I'm willing to believe the Japanese government when they say that the containment is not badly affected. We know there's some leakage, we know some radiation is getting out, but they seem to be telling us the, the truth and, and let's give them a chance to do it. They're doing pretty well so far. But a point of concern, perhaps, is the fact that we are told, uh, and as we have mentioned, that uh, seawater is being injected into these uh, reactor cores. Now, this is something that has never been done before. And Ilham al Karadawi, the very fact that such extreme measures are being used does hint at a degree of desperation, a last chance attempt to contain the situation, does it not? Oh, that's, uh, well, all that they can do at this stage to reduce the heat, which is the main problem inside the, uh, the reactor, but also they have been injecting boron, which absorbs neutron and stops the nuclear reaction. So this also will help uh, slow the generation of heat. So this is uh, supposed to be a procedure to reduce everything, but I mean, this might not avoid the situation of getting a meltdown, but this meltdown will affect the reactor and the usability of the reactor afterwards, but it will hopefully not affect the release of uh, radioactive material. Well, Kamal Matanudin, um, just to push forward on this particular point, um, clearly, as you have mentioned, Certainly, this uh, number one reactor will not be used again. It has, is at the end of its life anyway. A 40-year-old reactor is in terms, uh, is due actually to be shut down unless it gets a special license within the next month. But what we know as well, for example, or what we are told is that the cooling of things like the uranium rods, now newer uranium rods cool quicker than old uranium rods. Um, according to the scientists. So this would mean that in an older plant, the cooling process takes longer. And I think it's very important for you to explain why when that plant automatically shuts down, the nuclear core continues to generate heat. Why is this? One would expect that on the automatic shutdown, then the temperature increase would stop, even without the coolant. Would you explain? Well, yes, this is quite true that uh, uh, it's just not a question of uh, putting the switch on and off. And the moment you switch the switches off, everything will become uh, cool or cooler than what you, what you expect. But I think uh, these things take time. Even if you shut the, uh, the reactor completely, even then it takes time uh, for the uh, uranium and other um, uh, core material inside for them to cool down. So it is not a question of just uh, switching off a particular thing and then uh, expecting that the things will come will become cool cool enough uh, for you to uh, be able to prevent any radioactivity. So I think it takes time before the reactor can cool down to the temperatures uh, that are specified. It cannot be done uh, in just in a few moments and so on. So therefore the process of injecting either seawater or any other um, uh, maybe uh, liquid hydrogen or liquid, some other uh, uh, equipment that is, uh, elements that are available, they can be used to continue to try and cool the uh, reactor and bring it down to the temperatures uh, specified. It cannot be done 
in just a few moments and expect that everything will be uh, very acceptable after just a short time. Robert Kelly, it does appear to be almost a matter of time here. What you have is an equation that says you are attempting to cool down those uranium rods. At the same time, they are continuing to rise in temperature unless they are cooled down. There is a race, it would appear, to avoid that meltdown, to avoid the rods melting and dropping down into the bottom of the containment vessel and gradually possibly eating through and thereby releasing themselves into the outside environment. So it is a question of time and a very dangerous question of time, is it not? Well, it is a question of time, but as I said earlier, what you've got there is the decay heat from many, many radioisotopes that are a result of making the electricity. The fissioning of uranium produces uh, a kind of waste that remains hot because of radioactivity, and that is decaying away fairly fast. After a while, uh, that will reach a point where it would no longer boil the water, and then you're out of danger. But your situation you're in right now is it's so hot in there for probably the next few weeks, you've got to keep cooling it. So the issue is, can you get more cold water in than steam is boiling out? If you, if you get that equation going where you get more cold water in to keep the fuel cool, then steam is boiling out, you win. And that's what I think everybody is hoping at this point. You, you also made the comparison to Chernobyl, which I'd like to point out, had a massive explosion that was caused by um, some very faulty operational things. And so the reactor exploded, blew itself apart, and then its core wasn't uh, water and metal like this one. It had a lot of graphite, which caught on fire. And so you had 100 tons of graphite burning with radioactive materials interspersed with it being tossed into the air by this huge fire. This is not going to turn out like that no matter what. It may be, it could be a disaster if they don't succeed in getting the cold water in, but it's not going to be a Chernobyl. That was a very different situation. Well, Ilham al Karadawi, the Japanese Prime Minister, has described the earthquake, the tsunami, and all these subsequent events as the greatest crisis uh, faced by Japan since the end of the Second World War. Now, that war was ended by the detonation of two atomic devices within Japan, and yet Japan has continued to pursue nuclear energy in those subsequent decades, uh, attempting to raise uh, its energy output to 40% within the next uh, 10 years. At present, it stands at some 30%. Is this going to impact on the question of nuclear safety within Japan? I wouldn't think so, because nuclear is like everything else. It has risks and it has uh, ways of safety uh, measures that has to be taken. And every method of producing energy and lots of other things that we do have their own risks. And in the case of a tsunami, everything has been blown away. Uh, thousands and tens of thousands of people have been affected, uh, industry have been affected. So it's not only uh, nuclear that has been affected by this catastrophe. Uh, therefore, uh, from every uh, accident, we are learning more and more ways of safety. And uh, actually, what happened this time shows that uh, the safety measures have been raised quite a lot by the previous events. Well, come on, Matanudin, as we draw to an end, is the danger over at this particular point? Well, I think the Japanese government is doing its best to contain uh, the radioactivity leak that has taken place. And I think uh, the danger has subsided uh, to a large extent. Uh, but one cannot say things can go wrong. Uh, there could be uh, overheating in the other reactors as well. But at, at the moment, it seems uh, that the Japanese government has reacted correctly and uh, that it is being assisted also by the United States and by all other countries. And I think they will be able to get over and uh, try to and be able to contain uh, the damage that has been done so far. And I don't think uh, that we should be uh, looking towards a major catastrophe uh, in the nuclear plants in Japan. And one must add as well that it could take days or even weeks before the circumstances of what is actually happening within those nuclear cores becomes clear. Well, that is where we'll have to end this discussion. Thanks to our guests, Kamal Matanudin in Islamabad, Robert Kelly in Vienna, and Ilham Al-Karadawi here in Doha.
Thank you. And thank you so much for joining us here on this edition of Inside Story. We welcome your comments and suggestions. Please email them to us at insidestory at aljazeera.net. I'm Mike Hanna. Goodbye for now.